Well, I am absolutely quite honoured, really, to have the privilege of introducing Colin Gale to you, who you do actually know so well from his work here at BIAD, from his significant leadership and academic leadership, from his rigorous um, publications in combination with Jasbir Core, his um, textile book, and his um, fashion and textiles introduction book all popular in the library. In fact, they're so popular that if I could only get this copy, the other copy, the multiple copies are all out at the moment. Um, so it's a, it's a case of thinking, how do I introduce Professor Colin Gale, who's Director of po Postgraduate Programs in Fashion and Textiles here at Bayad, who was also the visiting professor at Tsinghua University, Beijing. My pronunciation will be inaccurate. I'm sure you'll correct it. And also visiting professor at Silvercorn University in Bangkok. And he's listed in the 2005 who's who um, in the world. So you can look up his reference there. I won't read it out to you now. More reading for you to do. Um, so how do I think about and describe Colin? Well, he's always had this interdisciplinary, international theme in all his research, his teaching, his professional practice, his professional life. So I thought, you know how it's always that first impression from a person that sort of stays with you a little bit? So I thought back, when did I first meet Colin? I was a mature student on the MA Fashion and Textiles program a Luddite who had to come to terms with computers and technology and of course turned to Colin for help. And I think what struck me immediately was, first of all, his extraordinary expertise and depth of knowledge. And unusual, I think, for somebody who does have so much rigour, his ability to make that accessible to somebody like me and to be so encouraging. And I think that's a quality that's continued through his professional life and through his teaching. And I'm sure all his students will pay tribute to those twin um, streams that he had. I thought perhaps I'd bring out a tiny little snapshot bit because I'm sure you'll be very familiar with his fashion and textiles um, research and profile that he's particularly developed since he's been here at Bayard. But that, at that first introductory stage, he was here in Bayard, and the eyesight's pretty poor, so the glasses will have to come on. Um, here at Bayard, he was um, responsible for IT across Bayard initially at that time. And he was also working at Goldsmiths College, London. And I thought I'd just read out to you this little bit. Whilst he was at the, in the Department of Media and Communications, Goldsmiths College, University of London, he was coordinator of postgraduate practice, MA television documentary, MA television drama, MA radio, MA journalism, MA image and communication. He was head of electronic graphics and animation, course director, MA image and communication, year and course tutor, BA anthropology and communications, year tutor, BA communications and sociology, Recognised Teacher University of London Fine Art, Recognised Teacher University of London Sociology. So I thought, polymath. So in best sort of rigorous research methodology tradition, I went to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia <laughs> told me that a polymath is a person whose expertise spans a significant number of different subject areas. I mean, what better description could one have for somebody who, though his profile is in fashion and textiles, you can see the rigorous underpinning, that broad intellectual inquiry that runs underneath that. And I think one of the characteristics with this agile and inquiring mind he has is his ability to find these synergies. So he doesn't run them up as silos. He's able to develop this expertise, look across at it, and bring it together. So I thought his inaugural lecture, I think he's being really brave because he's got a one-word one title, Beauty. 
that immediately, where one's in this sort of philosophical, aesthetic, cultural, challenging area, that I'm really looking forward to seeing how Colin navigates this in the next few minutes. In true introductory style, I need to now make way because I believe we're going to have the pleasure of a two-minute film clip from Colin's fan club. So, Colin, <laughs> over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Marley. Uh, I feel grossly embarrassed after that. Greetings from Manila, and congratulations on your professorship. Have a great day, and they are really lucky. Oh, really no. <laughs> Gets a bit boring in the middle, but it picks up at the end. You'll enjoy it. Chun's video never got through QQ, so we just have a still. <laughs> Hello, little girl. Congratulations on the professor's born and wish you fabulous a in the future. <laughs> this, is, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. I think all of us know what beauty is. If we were pressed to it, we understand it quite readily and it comes immediately to us. Um, but peculiarly, if I look back over the years, I can't ever remember telling a student that their work needed to be more beautiful or that they should think about beauty in the context of their researches. For thousands of years, beauty was a kind of central precept to do with the quality of life, the experience of life, and so on. But throughout the 20th century, it started to suffer a decline. And this talk really is about that decline, or at least the intellectual decline of beauty, while in the same time, the cultural place of beauty has remained unchanged. So it's going to be a quick tour, and I'm going to try and really skip over the intellectual philosophical side, because I know as soon as I go down there, as Marlene said, single subject topic, I will come to a very messy end. Uh, so this is a short tour, and it's partly to briefly look at how beauty has lost its place in our discourse, and then I'll look at um, where beauty has been sustained and central in our culture. Uh, then I'll have a look at uh, really the language of beauty, how we think about it, what taste is about and so on, and then look at some of the ramifications for the fact that if we accept that beauty is central to our culture and central to our experience, what's its role now? Uh, what place should we give it? And in a sense, what challenge does it represent within our educational system? So the first section is about that loss of the status of beauty as something that we ought to evoke or discuss. Uh, and that, I think, is a mixture of intellectual things, 
and the sort of progress of intellectual thought in the 20th century, the kind of political turmoils and upheavals that we had in the 20th century, and then things simply to do with the way we behave or the way we conduct ourselves. So the intellectual stuff, I think, we don't have to labour over. There's some simple things that for thousands of years, uh, certain cultures and civilizations, notably the Greeks in Western culture, beauty was a central topic and theme. Nobody questioned the role of beauty in the as part of the experience of being human and being alive. And typically, within kind of fine art discourse, we can see that philosophers like Immanuel Kant uh, or establishments like Royal Academy with Sir Joshua Reynolds really sustain and continue an idea that beauty is a significant aspect of creative endeavour as well as a significant aspect of the kind of spiritual and intellectual experience of life. We tend to think of the poet Coleridge these days as just a poet but actually, he was a significant thinker in the 19th century. And I think there's a series of statements from him here, which to some extent I'll revisit later in this talk. And they represent fundamentally what the view was about beauty at the end of the 19th century. So there's a statement there that really beauty is about how many things come together, that they come together in a form, in a shape. There's an envelope to beauty. And that not only within that shape of beauty, there's an idea of the vital, that there's some spirit that we, are, we kind of acknowledge and recognise within it. There's another thing which is to do with all the philosophical stuff, really. That the sense of beauty is intuitive, it's subjective. It's something we feel personally. It's something which is hard to pin down as having any kind of factual basis to it. Also, that when we see beauty, in funny ways, it may be outside our expectation. It may be things that we wouldn't normally accept or feel ourselves aligned to, yet we see the beauty within them, contrary to, say, our political view uh, or some other aspects of our belief systems. And then there's a kind of call in the last paragraph there to the creative, that there's a desire to master beauty, to kind of comprehend it, to understand its fundamental character, and that significantly at this particular time there's a kind of continuity in the idea of a relationship between beauty, God, and our ability in a sense to pursue, analyse and see beauty is it represents and shows, in a way, our relationship with God. So there's a, there's a kind of religious mission to beauty at that time uh, that Coleridge is engaging in. So at the end of the 19th century, people are pretty much happy in general with the idea of beauty from an artistic point of view. They see it as part of their uh, religious and spiritual remit. They see it as to do with higher culture. And so on. So what changes in the 20th century? What's the intellectual demise of it? I realised when I got these photos that if I'm going to be a professor, I need to buy a pipe. <laughs> uh, because it it's kind of obviously goes with, you know, the pose. So if you can buy me a present, buy me a pipe when I retire. Um, in the 20th century, these people are just symptomatic, really. They could be any number of different people, but they represent an intellectual journey. Russell, part of the Vienna Circle, uh, engaged in the project of logical positivism, the idea that there's knowledge which is solid, which is definite, and if we kind of work out all the language, we'll get that all tied in together, we'll have the rationalist project. And all the other stuff is fluff, nonsense. If we can't, if we can't fit in the box of stuff we can really, really know, then it's just fluff. Um, which really is to do with the empirical tradition, uh, the Anglo-American tradition. Then we have people like Heidegger. Heidegger's sort of notionally the founder of analytical philosophy. It begins that process, now we talk about deconstruction, that thing at the essence of postmodernism that we pick everything apart, that we, we play and pull and, and tear at stuff to kind of try and unravel its nature and its essence. And then post-war, 
I can remember when I was at Goldsmiths in the 80s, the influence of French philosophers, and particularly linguistic philosophy, semiologists, semiotics, and so on, um, on views about the arts. And Derrida is very typical of that. Basically, he says, well, you can go on saying stuff endlessly. But there's no resolution to explanation. And at the same time, there's the idea that reality, there's no end to reality. So basically, you end up with this huge linguistic game. And the consequence of that for the arts, I think, at that point, is the idea that everything is about subjectivity and relativism. We move into this strange anthropological space where actually that statement about beauty is the eye of the beholder becomes a kind of absolute. That the essential premise that existed before, that there was some kind of transcendence to beauty, that if I see beauty, the chances are you would see beauty and all these other people would see beauty, is suddenly shifted to an idea of a kind of argument that, well, actually, no, it's just up to you. Well, it's different. Different cultures have different views of beauty. Different individuals have different views of beauty. And so we see a diminishing of the idea of beauty because it becomes this sort of trivialized, very personal, very local experience. At the same time that this happens, uh, we can see kind of politics of oppression and rhetorics and liberation. Uh, we can see the... Uh, issues of gender, issues of race. Um, more recently, we can see issues of disability, that actually beauty is a, something which lights the tinderbox. It's a dangerous word. It's a thing which can be seen as hostile. Uh, black people had trouble with their appearance in the US. They felt it was diminishing to them in some way if they went for interview situations. And so suddenly, beauty becomes part of both uh, a language of oppression and a language of liberation. And it moves away from that previous sort of manifestation of it as something perhaps uh, truly aesthetic. What did this mean in practical terms? I remember that time of moving over from a kind of social sciences, technology, communications background into textiles. My original background had been in fine art. I found it very peculiar at that time. When I started talking to MA students, I thought, I'll start using a vocabulary which I feel is appropriate. That's very pretty. At that time, uh, textile students did a lot of stuff where really the idea came from fine art. And I found students were offended if I used words like pretty or sweet or nice. It was as if somehow you were seriously diminishing the integrity and status of what they were doing. Since that time, perhaps the last 20 years, and we've seen the rise of a, a more decorative style of design, the likes of Kath Kidston, now we can go to the shops and we can accept that stuff is pretty or sweet or whatever it might be. And in a way, uh, I think that suggests these are really little versions, variations, frissons of the idea of what beauty is. They lead us to beauty. Uh, they're little and local manifestations of it. But it's interesting that within our culture, various things are seen as problematic in terms of an aesthetic experience. And decoration is one of them. And later we'll see that there's issues about decoration in Asian culture as opposed to decoration in Western culture. So what do I think? I remember all those convolutions about avoiding being oppressive, about, in fact, the inability to prove that there's something such as beauty. And while I can see that that meant something to philosophers, I'm not sure it ever meant anything to me. I'm fortunate once upon a time I had a useful and interesting experience. I lay in a hospital with the prospect the next day I might die. And I listened to Schubert. I listen to the same music now and it sounds sweetly sentimental. At the time, it gave me great solace. It gave me calm and it gave me peace. But actually beauty has a fundamental role 
in our human psyche, that it can bring us states of mind or pleasure or motivation or desire that are central to the way that we behave and act in our society. So I look back to some of those earlier statements of beauty. The idea of uh, Greek ideas of beauty, of the shape and the form of the body. And there's a lovely poem here from uh, Charles Baudelaire about beauty. So in my mind, the journey of the 20th century about beauty was a false one for art and design. It might have been a correct intellectual one for philosophy and linguistics, but it was possibly wrong for us as a community. Which then takes me to another place, which is my peccadillos, my little interests, the things which attract me. Those include things such as princesses, <laughs> Audrey and Marilyn, the general issue of beauty, and whether beauty really can be said to exist in the same way. It's easy to look at those pictures of princesses and think that they were something simply created to get a husband, but they weren't. These paintings by the likes of Boucher or Winterhalter really tell other kinds of stories. They are the pictures of the celebrities of their day, and they have really fascinating backstories to them. In essence, uh, those paintings are about creating a confection a compelling look. And it's a language and a vocabulary of the identity of individuals which later we'll see carries into the representation of beauty in the 20th century. They really do have fascinating stories. And Madame Pompadour, who's over here, actually commissioned these paintings because Louis XV, she wanted to make sure that he remembered she was his number one mistress. So basically she commissioned a bunch of real exquisite paintings, stuck them on the wall so he couldn't avoid looking at her every day. Uh, but to me, how did I get to come to these? I think through fashion. Because those paintings to me are now fabulous records of the beginning of French couture, of the sewing tradition that comes out of the French court that later goes on to be what we now understand as Parisian couture. Or over here, a sissy. Sissy has a story even better than Princess Diana, in a way. An ordinary princess in the middle of nowhere comes swept up by the Emperor of Austria. He then, uh, as people do, goes on to have mistresses, but he separates her from her children. One of her sons commits suicide with his mistress in a hunting lodge uh, because she's too low in order. And then Sissy herself, at the end, I think, dies from a stab through the heart as an old lady. It's an unbelievably melodramatic story. Um, but I think within that, you start to, as you look at these kinds of pictures, you realise that the narrative which surrounds them enhances, in a sense, and elevates them from another way you might look at them, typically, which is the idea of their kitsch, their picture box, whatever it might be. Um, where do those pictures lead to? They lead to this kind of stuff. These fabulous photos are just stunning. Uh, this is by George Harrell, who took loads of photos of Hollywood movie stars. Uh, don't know whether it's apocryphal or not, but they said that he used to paint the eyelashes on the negatives. He was such a perfectionist. These were really important images about mega, mega superstars. Uh, and in that brief period there, uh, people like Anna Mae Wong, the first Chinese-American superstar, other people you've heard of, really. Um, it's about creating what I would call gloss and intensity, that there's uh, an agenda that carries on from those sweet paintings into a kind of cosmetic agenda, the agenda of appearance of a kind of super enhancement of the idea of what gorgeous women should look like, uh, but also borrowing on a kind of vocabulary of light and luminosity. 
And you can actually see this in this, this slightly silly little picture I've popped in as well, of a nice fluffy dog. But actually that vocabulary created then continues to this day uh, into an idea of the exquisite in the human form. There's a point sort of in the middle of the 20th century where really the uh, sort of trends of modernism for shape and form collide with uh, the idea of silhouette and luxury post Second World War and black and white photography to create really sumptuous ideas. For me this is uh, the most defining point of fashion in the 20th century. It's when that, if you remember that statement from uh, Coleridge about form and vitality coming together, this is a very clean envelope of what beauty can be and how it should be. There's a question I once asked my MA students. It's an interesting question. The odd thing is I knew what the answer would be. I said to them, who would you most like to be? Would you like to be Audrey or would you like to be Marilyn? I'll now ask that same question of the women in this audience. Put your hand up <laughs> if you'd like to be Audrey. Put your hand up if you'd like to be Marilyn. <laughs> same result. Uh, about 90% of women identify with Audrey Hepburn. What's that about? Is that actually about beauty? I think she's got some interesting transcultural values that you can see to do with her physiognomy and so on, uh, where she's as cute in Asia as she is in the West. I think it's about something else. I think this is not about the form. This is about the vital. The way we remember Audrey is a kind of interiorization of a femininity with Audrey. It's a kind of sensitivity. It's a struggle with life. It's a kind of a woman coming to terms. It's all those kind of cliches of girlness that are in there, and ambition and struggle. Whereas Marilyn, most of the pictures that Marilyn that are in popular culture are as a blonde bombshell. There's no substance to her. There's very little for women to actually emotionally identify with. So it's an interesting question. So where does beauty reside? And beauty is more than just the visage. It's, it's a kind of a mirror, a reflection of ourselves. I then asked another question when I put this together, which I hadn't thought of. Which two men would I pick? Why is there a dichotomy in beauty for women that's so easy to find, and I couldn't find it for men? It's an interesting prospect. I'll have to work on that one still. And if anybody wants this for their desktop, <laughs> I'm happy to forward it to you. So what are male princesses? We've seen princesses, what's a male prince? I'm not entirely sure. I think it's uh, sensitive to ideas of sexuality and so on, that throughout the 20th century, uh, we can see that politics again plays a part in the idea of male beauty. At the time that Oscar Wilde was around, aesthetes were all style. If I wanted to be an artistic man, I'd have long hair and I'd, I'd pose and I'd wear velvet and I'd be a lovely, lovely man until he was prosecuted for being a homosexual. Then they all decided that they'd look like German intellectuals and have shaved heads and bullet glasses and kind of look intense. That intense look actually becomes the look of the male artistic genius throughout the 20th century. You know, I am really, really here and it's me and it's important. And which then, of course, ends up as a sort of slightly fey stare of the male fashion model by the end of the 20th century, which is an engagement between you and me and my identity because it's all here. I love all of that kind of stuff. It gets more interesting. There's a rage at the moment in fashion for the idea of androgyny. Uh, here we have a picture of a very beautiful woman who's actually a man called Andre Pejic, who's the model for, uh, what's his name? 
French designer, Gaultier, Jean-Paul Gaultier, sorry, slip my moment for a moment. Um, this just seems to be dramatic, but of course male beauty in this sense is nothing new, and androgyny is nothing new. Actually, you can go back in almost every culture thousands of years, and the idea of beautiful men, as opposed to handsome men, is a very typical one. And actually, André Pedic simply reminded me of Bjorn Andresen, uh, those of you who remember Death in Venice. Remember an exceptionally beautiful young boy in that, who now is a very craggy, middle-aged man, I have to say. But still, he's moved from beautiful to being handsome, lucky fellow. One of, one of the things I didn't understand, going back to that idea of beauty being a mirror, or seeing beauty in a mirror, I never understood when I was a teenager why girls liked David Essex. I just couldn't get it. I kind of looked at him and I thought, I don't understand. What do they see in him? Um, I could kind of understand Mark Bolan. You know. And today, of course, it's Justin Bieber. What do they see in Justin Bieber? <laughs> I think it's partly about an identification of the feminine that they see in themselves, that there's a, there's a kind of grooming, a preening that's going on, uh, which they feel comfortable with or confirms uh, a kind of sexual identification. So we've looked at people, and we're going to look at some other stuff now. And I think the big problem, whenever you talk about beauty in intellectual senses, is subjectivity. What on earth is that all about? You know, how can we get over that? Can we circumvent that? And I actually think that uh, a lot of aesthetics finds resonance in the vocabulary of the digestive system. So it's about taste, uh, stomach, uh, tongue. Because when I try other systems, they never really particularly work. There's one here, a map I created for a lecture some years ago, which was if I had to pick two colours to kind of resonate about an aesthetic choice, in particular parts of the world, which two colours would I pick? Some of it seems remarkably sensible. Uh, so if I go over to China, uh, the blue and pale blue and red seems sensible. By the time I get to Hong Kong, red and yellow seems sensible. By the time I get to Bangkok, brown and gold seems sensible. I couldn't believe that. I thought this, uh, this feels really dodgy uh, as, a, as a kind of aesthetic mapping of colour of preferences around the world. I also thought, well, perhaps you could look at contours to deal with the idea of subjectivity, that, you know, if you put one, one country's outline on top of another, we'd understand that actually beauty, although it may be subjective, it's around the edges that we differ, that in the middle there's a, there's a consensus about what beauty is, but it came out a mess like that. And I think if I put Japan in the middle, it would blow it even more out of the water as, as, a, as trying to find a diagrammatic notion of what it is. And I think it's actually because um, beauty is different. It's not a single thing. It doesn't just exist there. It's a living <laughs> thing. And our experience of it is living. And it's time-based. There's a lovely theorem in fashion, which I think is a little bit suspect. Uh, but it was appropriate in the 60s or 70s or whenever it was design when, when fashion changed so regularly and frequently. Um, and basically it just indicates that we go through various phases of our relationship with sort of the aesthetic position of things. Uh, and to illustrate that I have the charming film Genevieve or whatever it's called, where you can see that in the 60s they looked back to sort of, you know, 1904 or whenever it was. So they looked back 50 50 or so years, 70 years, which put it in the quaint and charming. So if you want to make a movie that's quaint and charming, just place it 50, 70 years before whenever you are. There's an American philosopher, Rorty, I think his name is, who said some stuff about colour photography. And uh, within black and white photography, you're always drawn to a narrative but there's an idea about colour being something that just comes straight into you. Before you can go through some sort of cognitive process, colour just rushes in. And I think taste is a bit like that. And I think beauty is a bit like that. You don't get time to process it. It just goes straight in. 
Uh, there was an interesting article in Scientific American many years ago, which was about seeing a snake. And the fact that the brain actually goes through two phases. The first phase goes, oh my God! And the second phase goes, it's a snake, what shall I do? And I think what that means is that there's some things which are really through a different channel into us. They find us more fundamentally. And one of the problems with beauty is this difference between something which is a sense and a sort of conceptual explication of it. My personal experience of that is perhaps along the line of drinking. The fact that I've been to various places in the world and thought, wow, this is a really fabulous drink. Why don't we have this drink in the UK? Uh, so sugar cane in Singapore, longer than Jews, most of Southeast Asia. Why do they only sell green tea frappuccino in China? I don't know. Uh, it's fabulous drink or hot orange tea and so on. So in essence, that's about a kind of absorption, how things, in a sense, are not to do with the world of language. There's a kind of physicality, I think, to the nature of beauty and our experience of it. But you can also see that there's a kind of aesthetic vocabulary that exists in different ways in different cultures, which arises out of a, a kind of cultural construction. So I always used to find that Chinese fashion designers used to do pointy bits on their clothes design. I think, why do they do pointy bits? Actually, of course, um, much of East Asia, you find the buildings have pointy bits. There's a pointy bits kind of vocabulary in their design aesthetic. And so too in sort of India, there's a, there's a kind of scallop vocabulary going on there. So we're struck between, when we think about beauty, these two things, the sort of cultural constructions, the things we're familiar with, our experience over time, and the way it sort of immediately enters us. I think another sort of digestion issue about beauty, I love or at least I loved Matisse once upon a time. And I think if I see Matisse's paintings, because he's a painter's painter, in reality, they still uh, make me tingle. But the fact is, I've spent 50 years seeing them on birthday cards. Actually, I'm sick of them. <laughs> it's kind of entering the arena of decorative kitsch. I remember going to Another one of those museums in Paris. I used to like buying Art Nouveau clocks. The uh, pretty sexy clock, I like that. It's lovely, got to have that. And I walked, there's a zone where they have a Nouveau collection, which is a room entirely in Art Nouveau, furniture in Art Nouveau. I've never had furniture make me feel physically sick before. <laughs> the entire experience of walking through it was one of nausea, of dizziness. Very strange. Um, to be utterly immersed in an aesthetic which causes you that kind of uh, emotional, physical imbalance. Which implies the opposite, that there are environments which through their aesthetic construction can create great senses of well-being or pleasure. So there are questions about taste. And questions about taste have some relationship with the idea of beauty. I've been travelling to Asia for over 20 years now, I think. And there are things I still don't know whether actually I understand how they feel about aesthetics in Asia. I've been going long enough that some things I've become familiar with. But actually it doesn't offend me to eat in a restaurant full of crystals. And I like gaudy colours. And I enjoy certain pleasures of kind of things which almost as a kind of tourist quality that I become a spectator of their aesthetic. And it's difficult to judge uh, between one culture to another what beauty is. I can see when they hold things up as beauty uh, that sometimes that's a challenge. And I think this familiarity is one way in which we can access beauty. And so the question then becomes as well, Going back to that anthropological idea that their beauty is not my beauty or my beauty is not their beauty, um, whether we can say that the appropriation of beauty works, and we know it does. Historically, we know people are quite happy to nick ideas of beauty from different cultures. This is, um, I don't know, 
slightly questionable um, Galliano's designs for Dior um, based on um, Adam Butterfly, I think. And they're be I consider them to be beautiful pictures. They're certainly very <coughs> popular with students. And so, where do we go with this? It's easy to see, and it, it sort of um, sometimes surprised me, how different the world is when you go to different places of the world. That actually, in spite of talk of globalisation, that actually there are fundamental and deep things which are hard to access, hard to comprehend about people's aesthetic value and set. And that will always remain true. But at the same time, there's something else going on, which is actually as we become urban societies, uh, as we develop similar media infrastructures, as we copy formats, that actually our social experience, our daily experience, our cultural experiences become very similar. And within that, we start to share certain aesthetic repertoires and we stimulate ourselves in similar ways about what we enjoy, what we consider to be pretty, and what we consider to be beautiful. So going back to kind of Coleridge's statements, just testing a little bit whether I still really believe in Coleridge, there's some pretty non-contentious statements, uh, which is a sort of combination of form with an idea of some sort of essence that we recognise in that form is a mark of beauty. I'm not a homosexual, but I find this man extremely attractive. And I think that kind of chords with Coleridge's statement that it can inspire pleasure contrarily to interest. Beauty is something outside of us as a stimulus. And in the end, this idea that there's some sort of spiritual union going on, which is probably not such a big popular idea in certain communities now, but that we recognise a vitality and it is an essential part of the package of beauty that comes in different kinds of packages and forms. Why is it important to us now? Why should we think about it? when in a sense it's kind of intellectually or philosophically dead? Why should we care about it in our educational process? I think one, because evidently it's a cultural attractor, it pulls us together in times of globalisation. We appreciate whether it's tourists or through experience and we benefit and we grow from different people's definitions or establishments of beauty. I think when you think about the vocabulary of creative industries, beauty has profoundly and evidently been a driver of major commercial activity. Billions and billions and billions of pounds are created around the basis of beauty. And it's not simply about cosmetics industry or lipstick. It's at the core of product. It's at the core of communication. As an individual practitioner, I have practiced, I find beauty is a difficult thing. It both challenges the way I feel when I create and it challenges the way I think when I create. It's almost like a computer game of nested challenges to try and achieve something that's profoundly beautiful. From the point of view of students, if beauty is such a value in commerce, then surely it must be something our students can judge that they have a repertoire and mechanism to assess it by. Fundamentally, it's something which before, for thousands of years, we placed in a significant position culturally. Now we treat it in a shallow way, as if it's a personal choice or something trivially to do with appearance. To my mind, Beauty is an essential ambition in art and design. A thing of beauty is a thing that lasts forever. I think that's as true now as when it was said. And so, that's my little trip around beauty. Thank you very much.
Colin for that. That was something I've been really looking forward to and now I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from the um, floor about this. Before I open the talk, could I just um, read out to you the title of Colin's PhD thesis in 1994 when Colin became Dr. Gale and now we're talking to Professor Gale just to sort of fill in some of those extra sections. So his PhD thesis was modelling creative practice, a means of describing the constituents and circumstances of original thought and action with special reference to the use, to the use of computers in art and design. So much in that title and so much has been in this lecture. Um, could I now open questions to Colin? Yes, please. Um, I enjoyed it very much, Colin. Thank you. Um, I wondered if I could ask you, you were very economical with the word aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And I think aesthetic seems to be used in current parlance as a neutral way of describing some thing we appreciate subjectively, almost a substitute for this word beauty that we've had the decency to expose to us. And I wonder what you think about the use of the word aesthetic in place of that of beauty. Mm -hmm. Because that, I'm sure it could be a treatise in itself. I think, I, I think that it the, seems to be a euphemism yeah. for beauty. I, th I think the problem in art and design that aesthetics is, is very much to do with the discourse between fine art and philosophy and it is obviously is a branch of philosophy. And so as soon as you go down the intellectual road of engaging with aesthetics, you suddenly find yourself in a, in a complicated dead end. I think in another way, sometimes aesthetics is used to kind of represent a notion that there is such a thing as style. Um, so it's a kind of code for uh, a genre of style that people might engage in. And I think, uh, in a way, we've moved to a kind of managerial approach <coughs> to the idea of uh, the emotional effect that objects and things have on us. That actually, because uh, aesthetics and beauty have become problematic, almost embarrassing, in, in the way that uh, late Victorian painters were embarrassing in the 60s and 70s, you know, everybody denied pre raphaelites It's kind of like we deny the culture of beauty, we don't particularly want to talk about it, it's politically sensitive, all the rest that I've said. Um, so the problem is how do you restart, how do you reboot uh, a kind of intellectual engagement with the idea of what beauty is and how do you do it in a way which is appropriate to the sort of political sensitivities and the intellectual progress that's taken place because in a sense it's sort of gone through a demise of perhaps a hundred years. Um, but I, the, the thing that I thought was interesting is the fact that it is so much, from a designer's point of view, so much to do with business. Um, and actually you can't leave it in a silo called aesthetics or in a tradition of sort of fine art philosophical discourse or even in a kind of social science premise of subjectivity and relativism and hermeneutics and all the rest, uh, that for creative people it should be a significant element of something they address in their practice and business. So I think aesthetics basically says let's flag up a complicated conversation, whereas beauty says it's in my face. I can't avoid it. I know it when I see it. I'm pretty sure other people see it when I see it. Um, and that's why before, I think, beauty was such a central thing in sort of cultural discourse, because it's self-evidently there that actually uh, the sort of linguistic twistings of philosophy of the 20th century simply don't diminish what essentially exists. I enjoyed that very much as well. Um, do you think there's an element here about English and British reticence in the use of language? Um, the, the, and you meant there were a lot of images which derived from French culture. 
And there seems a much more ready enjoyment of talking about objects and things, yeah. and using a language which is incredibly expressive, uh, which the English don't seem and the British don't seem to want to engage with. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly a, a sort of Northern European puritanical <laughs> streak, right. uh, and, and, and something I, I neglected, because my head is full of rubbish to do with this, uh, was, was partly to do with decorative cultures in Asia. And one of the experiences I've had years ago was meeting a lot of Malaysian painters who worked with such intense hot colour, and it affected the way I painted after that. Uh, but it's true that other cultures have a much more uh, sensual relationship, I think, sometimes with design or the world of objects, but more generally in their life. There's not a kind of embarrassment about something like beauty. But I don't... I don't know whether it's uh, British, I don't know whether it's simply to do with the way our culture has evolved for the past hundred years, because, you know, if you look back to high romanticism uh, in England or Britain, it's as romantic as you can get, uh, that, you know, pre-Raphaelite notions of beauty are, are self-evident, uh, and obviously went through a phase when they were embarrassing almost, so, but I... I take the idea, as, as you kind of would really, that if I went to Italy, there'd be a very different notion of a, a kind of emotional description of what objects were and how you felt about objects. And there's, there, there is a kind of editing out of the emotional uh, in the design vocabulary in the UK, possibly. I remember years ago when I first started making glass, I, in one of my early exhibitions, I was asked to do a, a, an artist statement, which I always hated. Uh, and it was very short, but the last line I remember was that I said, I tried to make beautiful things. Do you think that's still, I mean, I still have that ambition. I don't make anything anymore, but I would still embrace that ambition. Do you think that is, um, Contemporary now. I mean, do you think people still want to make beautiful things? Artists and designers, obviously. I, I, I think what you have to accept is, if you, it's, it's, it's like that. The idea that there should be a single ambition in the arts. There obviously doesn't have to be a single ambition. There's a point where you can see that the ambition, um, in sort of artistic circles, moves from being kind of producing things which are beautiful shapes, lovely shapes producing things which are, well, this is really clever, you know, or this is arch, or this is ironic, uh, or this is smart in some way. Um, and I think it's true that at any particular time, there's a kind of main target which the culture looks at. And there's been a point where really, if you, if you wanted to say, I want to make beautiful things, uh, people would see you as an old fuddy-duddy uh, who's, who's kind of lost their time and day and go back to your studio in the middle of nowhere. Um, I actually think it's a reasonable ambition. There's this thing that happens to you, so, sorry to say this, David, but you know, we reach a certain age, uh, and we liberate ourselves from, from the fashionable objectives of the creative world, and we pursue those things which we feel reflect our own ambition and engagement with things. Uh, and certainly I've... The problem is, I think, because I try and do beautiful things, but I have a, a very odd idea of how I try and achieve them, which is because I think you have to kind of go through ugliness to achieve beauty. You know, it's, it's this complex thing, whereas I can see something when I used to teach graphic design. There's a very instant satisfaction of the idea of harmonious composition. Um, and often people confuse the idea of the harmonious and the kind of fulfilled and completeness within aesthetics with the idea of beauty. And I think beauty is much more complex than simply something which is pleasing. But I think often when you say you're trying to do something beautiful, people say, oh, you're just trying, and they assume you're just trying to do something pleasing. Uh, and then they'll say, well, what's pleasing for you is different from something else. And so our, our, the intellectual challenge that we've set ourselves about what beauty is has, I think, been lost. And that's, 
I think it's therefore a valid thing to aspire to. Can I just share something with you? Years and years ago, when I started teaching, I was uh, responsible for an A-level class. And a young lad walked into the A-level class, and he had a brain condition that had resulted from an accident that meant that every day he forgot who he was, who his parents were, and everything that we take for granted. And he could, would come He'd be driven to my A-level class every week and I would introduce myself again and I would tell him what to do and he would get cracking and produce some art. And every week his work was beautiful and he understood when I would say the composition is beautiful. He understood the language, he understood the intention, but of course he couldn't relate to progress mm. or um, a project that spanned time. But he did understand beauty. And it was a really interesting experience working with him. And he followed on slightly mm. from that because memory and beauty and our ageing with that, yes. I think, is also quite important in this I think construct. Well, uh, another thing that I didn't cover, because otherwise we just get endlessly bogged down, um, is, is the fact that a lot of talk about beauty is to do with the idea of language and aesthetics. Yeah. Uh, in a similar way, you can say, well, there's a lot of stuff to do with psychology, you know, that's, that's possibly about beauty. The fact is that scientifically, there's another definition of those kind of, you know, psychophysical reactions, which is to do with uh, neuropsychology or cognitive, you know, science or whatever it might be. It's to do with synapses and brain cells. And we know uh, that certain kinds of face. Uh, naturally most people accept as good looking and it works without question and it's something they think to do with when we're born the relationship we make with our mother that we look for certain kinds of harmony and they think it's also to do with a genetic reading of your potential partner yeah. that if they've got a wonky face they might be a dodgy gene um, and, and so there's that there's that idea of, of is you know beauty as nature as opposed to beauty as nurture um, and I'm sure there's lots of sort of different variants. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with beauty is like any word in a language, it's actually like the word creativity, for example, is just this huge big bag that doesn't really quite mean anything. We're not quite sure, uh, but it has use and it has power as a descriptor. Yeah. So, yeah. Curious, yeah, thank you for the talk. I was curious when you talked about that quite candid moment when you were ill, you know, very seriously, mm -hmm. when you were in bed and you were listening to Schubert. And I'm just wondering if this sort of was like concentrated trauma that you were going through affected how you perceive something? Because you said subsequently. No, I, don't, I think you, you, you go through this thing where you sort of, you know, you sort of think, well, am I, am I happy with. <laughs> have, I, have I had a reasonable life? I did feel I had a reason why, uh, but the thing about Schubert was that it was just um, exquisitely peaceful, if you know what I mean, and uh, it sort of set a frame of mind, and there, there was this, and I think you know, beauty has therapeutic qualities, or there are variations of beauty that have therapeutic quality, and that's interesting, and then subsequently when you're not looking for therapy, or you're not kind of you know particularly angst-ridden, or you're having a whoopee time. Perhaps Schubert seems more of its historical period, or um, of its affect, aesthetic affectations of its time. And I, going back to that idea of the, the theory about fashion, I think we focus in and out of beauty. You know, beauty is not. I think there's an assumption that beauty fits into an empirical vocabulary that it's there, that it's transcendent. If you don't believe that, then it doesn't exist. Actually, it's, it's something much more um, time-based, experiential-based, psychological, physiological, indeterminate. And I think the question, if you're an artist or designer, is do you need to understand all the mumbo-jumbo? You know, do you have to become a philosopher? Do you have to win an argument to accept its existence? I don't think you do. 
uh, because just loads of people would naturally understand what they consider to be beautiful. Um, and that's enough in terms of doing things in a kind of action-based or pragmatic philosophy to simply accept that something's beautiful at a particular time and appropriate to a time and appropriate to an experience. So I think that was uh, my experience at that point was uh, the profundity in that music, which at some point one identifies with, and perhaps you slip away from that or back to it at particular times. Colin, I'd be interested if you could just elaborate a little bit more. You had had significant um, professional involvement with Asia in the last so many years, and you have spoken in this about cultural differences and shifts of perception. And I'm wondering if you can think back sort of pre that time that you started to go to Asia compared with now when you have such significant expertise across the area. And that there are a few things that really stand out to you most strongly about potential <coughs> shift or change in perception yourself because of those ex involvement with those experiences. I, th I think one thing is uh, decoration, which I, I think perhaps it is Northern Europe more than Southern Europe, uh, but that if we ever had a decorative culture, which one believes we did have in medieval times when we used to paint everything, sort of bright lurid colours, um, We've kind of pressed colour out of our environment to a large extent, although we see it starting to re-enter through modern architecture and so on. Um, and also the decorative vocabulary, which is, which is uh, much of Asia. It's like listening to rock and roll music, heavy metal, full blast in terms of the decorative culture. It's, it's immersive experience of uh, a luminosity, a, a kind of fun and an energy which simply doesn't exist uh, in the West. And I, th I think um, bit by bit, I found myself comfortable with that. Uh, and I think I would say there was a time when I would just look at that as pretty weird or a bit cheesy or uh, really almost tasteless in a way. Um, whereas you do assimilate, adjust, uh, and you develop an expectation and it's really about stimulating a pleasure cycle. It, I, I think, going back to aesthetics and, and so on, there's a drug-like quality uh, to aesthetics that the more you stimulate it, the more you respond to it in a way. And I think my experience has been that there's a, a visual vocabulary that I've been able to respond to. There's a cultural vocabulary which has been more elusive to me and which I'm never quite sure of uh, and sometimes I ask people about whether they think something is nice or not. And uh, one example might be jade. I can understand uh, sort of decorative qualities of jade, but as a stone, I find it fairly not hugely attractive. It's a sort of wishy-washy grey-green, you know, I, I just don't get it. And I spoke to one of my students about, well, what is it? And she said, well... You know, ever since she was little, her mother used to bring it out, so it would be given this social status um, from, you know, year dot, which, uh, going back to that idea that beauty is more than just its visual form, it's also an idea of vitality, that there's a, an idea of vitality stimulated in the culture, uh, which raises it up. I think another thing that I've thought over the years is what I would call uh, the touristic spectacle. Uh, which is to do with the picturesque. And the picturesque is a confusing thing because what you find beautiful in the picturesque often to local people just looks like tatty rubbish buildings. To you it's charming, you know, um, but they don't see it as such. Uh, other stuff you look at you think is really interesting, they just see it as old. Um, and so there's that problem of uh, trying to tune in to a set of cultural perceptions about environment and material environment and material culture. which surprisingly, you, you can go for decades and you still don't get it. You just, you, you can't become, you know, a Thai person, you can't become a Chinese person. And there's, there's sort of anthropologists um, 
sort of suggest, you know, you, 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 the only person who can really understand what it's like to be a member of the tribe is a member of the tribe. Um, and I think to some extent within aesthetics, that's a, a beauty and taste that remains true. But having said that, I think there's a lot which is about uh, the fact that cultures change, that their, their agenda of beauty, their agenda of taste changes over time. And there's one slide there, a, a talk about modern life, urban life, and the fact that actually the cultural infrastructure of Asia in, in urban environments anyway is, is almost identical to the urban infrastructure in the West. And then you find yourself sharing aesthetic cues uh, and you recognize them you know, instantly almost. And that's quite interesting as well. I think overexposure is a problem, uh, and the thing is that if anything ever turns out to be aesthetically pleasing and there's money attached, then sooner or later it gets overexposed, uh, which, is, which is like the problem with Matisse. I, I don't know how to read lots of Matisse anymore, just because I've seen so much of it endlessly chucked in my face with endless colour variations, and uh, it's sort of, I think that's true of everything, that um, beauty is not a fixed thing. What you can say is that um, beauty is probably a set of behavioural responses that we have that are consistent to all of us, uh, that those responses are quite definitely there, that there are triggers to those, but also that, um, as in any kind of behavioural activity, you know, over a continuous exposure, sort of weakens, weakens the effect. And I think the consequence that you get is a, is a kind of culture of excess. You know, the, 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 the odds of what beauty is have to be racked up all the time. And the aesthetic kind of value has to be racked up all the time uh, until in the end it becomes incredibly arch and mannered and then starts to look ridiculous. Um, so that there are kind of cycles, I suspect, to how we move aesthetic taste through our culture. And it sort of reaches a, a high point and then it collapses again. At the beginning, I indicated that I thought it was a brave man who took on that term, beauty. I think you've shared so many thoughts and observations with us, Colin, the starting points, really. And I think it could lead to some very significant discussions around this topic. I'd like to thank you and congratulate you, Colin Gale, Dr. Colin Gale, now Professor Colin Gale, and congratulate you on your uh, academic achievements. Thank you for sharing. <laughs>